Hello everyone, this is Dr. Young, and in this video, I'm gonna introduce thermodynamics to you. Um, thermodynamics is a really big topic. This is just an introduction. We'll talk about the first and second law briefly, the difference between systems and surroundings, and a little bit about um, exothermic and endothermic, what those terms mean. And then in future videos, we'll do a lot more in-depth look at things like enthalpy. So, thermodynamics. It's basically just the study of the changes in energy during a course of a chemical reaction, or chemical transformation, physical transformation, or nuclear transformation. And so thermo, the word thermodynamic literally means like heat change, right? We're talking about heat change. And we're going to look at this in terms of, you know, throughout the year, the change in heat, the change in energy of a chemical transformation, right? Remember, that's when you rearrange atoms. It's a rearrangement of atoms. We are going to look at it in terms of uh, physical changes, right? That's things like um, phase changes, right? Changing a phase. So the only thing that's changing is our, our attractive forces, not really the actual molecule themselves. So this will be things like, you know, melting, boiling, dissolving, things like that. And then lastly, nuclear. Right, which is where you actually um, change the element. Changing the element themselves, right? So taking, for example, um, two um, hydrogen atoms, for example, and turning that into like a helium, right? So nuclear stuff, we always think of like plutonium and uranium, but just, just changing the element in any, any way. So we're going to look at using thermodynamics in all of these situations over the course of, you know, a year of chemistry, for example. Right now, we're going to start with looking at physical and chemical changes, and we're going to save nuclear for later. But any, any type, of, type, of type of transformation is going to have a corresponding change in energy. So that's what we want to take a closer look at. So let's start talking about the laws of thermodynamics. The first law of thermodynamics basically is a law of uh, conservation. Um, we already talked about conservation of mass when we talk about balancing equations and stuff, but this is a conservation of energy. So energy is neither created nor destroyed. It's only transformed into one type into another. Um, so think like, again, back to kind of physics or something like that, where potential energy turns into kinetic energy when something is like falling, for example. So it's not that the energy is disappearing, it's that it's transforming from one type to another type. And what the first law of thermodynamics is saying here is that the total energy the total energy change in a system must be equal and opposite to the energy in the, uh, of the surroundings. So we have these two terms here. We have a system, which I'm representing as this box. And then we have the surroundings, which I'm representing as everywhere else outside of the box. are the surroundings. And what it's saying is that if you have an amount of energy go in, it has to be equal and opposite of the amount of energy that went out or that came from the thing. So what I'm saying here is that is that if you look at this transfer of heat or energy from the surroundings into the system, that these values are going to be equal and opposite of one another. So for example, if from the point of view of the surroundings, you lost, um, let's say 15 kilocalories, the idea is that this system gained 15 kilocalories. And uh, furthermore, as far as values go, um, what we're saying is that when something loses, if you lose energy, and whether you want to call energy um, E or Q or whatever, if you lose energy, we always say that that value is negative. It's always going to have a negative sign in it. Similarly, if you gain energy, again, whether it's, you just use generically energy or we're talking about heat here, if you gain energy, it's always positive. So what we can say is that from the point of view of the surroundings, this Q value would be something like uh, negative 15 kcals. And let me give myself a little more space. 
negative 15 kilocalories. That means that from the system's point of view, that means that it gained positive 15 kilocalories, right? So the values are the same. And again, I'm just making up 15. But what's important here is that the thing that lost the energy was negative. The thing that gained the energy was a positive number. And so if you're transferring heat from the surroundings to the system or vice versa, the idea is that they have to be equal to one another and opposite to one another. And as far as this gaining and losing thing, the analogy I always use here is that this is kind of think like your bank account. Right. If you lose money, right, if you lose money from your bank account, that's a negative. You're going to see negative one hundred dollars on your bank account. But if you gain money right in your um, when you go online or whatever, it's always a plus you know, a hundred dollars or whatever. So it's just like your bank account. If you lose something, that's a minus. If you gain something, it's a plus. And so this will get kind of tricky just because we have to take the point of view of either the um, system or the surroundings, but we'll talk more about that later. So first law is just that energy is not created or destroyed. That is simply um, transformed in one from one form to another one. And when you transfer energy from a system to the surroundings or vice versa, the values are going to be equal to one another, like I chose 15, but they're going to be opposite in the amount. So one thing is going to lose 15 kilocalories while the other thing is going to gain 15 kilocalories. So let's look at this reaction of water in its solid state becoming water in its liquid state, right? H2O solid, H2O liquid. So we're literally just talking about melting ice here, right? So here's a block of ice. Here's a puddle of water. Now, you already have some intuition on this, so I think this is a good example to start with, which is if you're going to melt ice, are you going to take are you going to take heat away from that ice or are you going to give it heat? Right. We use we uh, always have to give ice energy in order for it to melt. Right. As soon as we take it out of the freezer or whatever, it starts to melt because it, uh, it absorbs the energy from the environment. And so if I'm going to draw just Q here, I'm going to say that, well, my heat energy is going to go into the block of ice. It's going to go into the block of ice. And if I come over here and look at my uh, delta E equals Q plus W, right? So this is saying that the change in energy is going to equal the heat transfer plus the work. Well, I didn't do any work, and we're not going to really do a whole lot of work um, for, for this part of class, right? We're not changing the pressure or volumes or anything like that and doing work to move an object. We just heated something up, we just, and we just uh, changed the phase of something. So for me, this delta E... This change in energy equals the heat transfer, right? So I'll say change in energy. My change in energy equals the heat transfer. And for my block of ice here, right? For my block of ice, it absorbed. It absorbed heat, right? It absorbed heat, which means my, my value for Q is going to be positive, right? It gained heat. The block of ice gained heat, right? My block absorbed the heat. Anytime you absorb heat and your Q is positive, we call that type of process an endothermic one. We call it endothermic, right? Endo meaning like to enter. Heat is entering that block of ice. It has to go into that block of ice. It's endothermic. And always, 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 when we have an endothermic reaction, my Q is going to be a positive number because it's gaining heat. The definition is that you absorb the heat. The heat absor uh, is entering the object. Now, that's going to be opposite from an exothermic reaction, which we'll see here. This would be an example of an exothermic reaction where I have water in its gas phase uh, turning into water in its liquid phase here, right? So here I have basically just steam. And it's turning into, again, our puddle of water. Now, this is a little less intuitive, I think, but it turns out that when you take steam and you turn it into a puddle of water, the steam is actually releasing energy. It's heating up its surroundings. It's going to heat up its surroundings. But again, we're still not really doing any work here. So again, my change in energy is only going to be due to this transfer of heat. So my delta, my delta E, my change in energy for steam turning into a puddle of water, it still just has to do with the, uh, the heat transfer, this Q. 
But in this one, right, the steam is actually losing heat. And remember that heat isn't temperature. We'll talk more about that in future videos, but heat is not temperature. Heat has the ability to change phases and to change temperature, but it is not temperature. And well, I know that seems kind of weird right now, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But the steam is going to lose heat, or in other words, its Q is going to be negative. It's going to release heat. Or I'll, I can also say that, I can say that it releases, releases heat. And when you say any of these things, that means you are exothermic. That process is exothermic. Exo, think like exit. Heat is leaving the thing. So when steam condenses to water, it releases heat. And even weirder, I think, is that when water turns into ice, that's also releasing heat. Reheat is leaving that, that, um, that water. So we have these two terms, endothermic and exothermic, and they're just tacked onto whether or not the thing you're looking at, did that thing gain energy, in which case it was endothermic, that's an endothermic process, or did it lose energy, in which case it was an exothermic process. And in both of these cases, and we're going to see in most of these cases, that change in energy for that thing is equal to Q. It's equal to that heat transfer. Now, I keep on saying the thing, but the, when I say the thing, what I mean is the system that you're studying. And so we have these two terms, systems and surroundings. And a system is just, it's just a part of the universe that you're looking at, that you're trying to focus on. And you just define it when you want to start doing this math and looking at the changes that are occurring. But your system can really kind of be anything. It can be real, 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 real tiny, or it can be very, very, very large, right? We call it like the solar system. We can look at our solar system as a thing of, you know, is energy coming in or out of? Is matter coming in and out of like our solar system, for example? Um, and your examples can, I mean, they can, they can be they're like anything. You can look at a specific reaction, like mixing an acid in a base. That can be a system. And you're asking yourself, well, is it going to release energy or absorb energy? It could be a hunk of metal, a car engine, a house, a, a whole nation, a planet. You know, it can be as big or small as what you want. So in this first one, I have an example of just a reaction where, you know, it might just be, like I was saying, it might be just, you know, HCl plus NaOH turning into sodium chloride and water. And I want to know what's going on with my Q here, right? Do, do I have, like, for example, am I releasing heat from this reaction? Or am I absorbing heat from this reaction? Does this reaction feel hot or does it feel cold? Similarly, I could go over here and look at a car engine. A care engine. A car engine. I don't know if this is a car engine. It looks kind of like it to me, but I'm not an expert on this. Car engine. Let's just say engine. This can be, right, this is much bigger than just a reaction. There's a lot going on here. There's all kinds of fluids. There's all kinds of processes. There's uh, uh, belts pulling things, fans turning, pistons firing, fluids being pushed, being pumped from one thing to another. There's a whole bunch going on. But you could look at this whole, this whole engine and ask yourself, okay, well, for this whole engine here, for this whole engine here, do I have heat uh, coming out of that engine or does that engine absorb heat? And it depends on the thing you're talking about, right? If you fire up your car, absolutely, it's going to be exothermic. It's going to lose heat to its surrounding, right? Car engines are hot. So let's talk a little bit more about these, these systems and these, these surroundings here. So there's different types of systems. The three main types are isolated systems, closed systems, and open systems, right? So isolated, closed, open. And uh, the classic example of an isolated system um, that everyone talks about would be something like um, a thermos, right? A, a thermos. I know that's a brand, but you know what I'm saying. A thermos. Like, say you have um, some hot chocolate in a thermos. Now, in a thermos, does heat transfer to the surroundings? Ideally, if you have a really good thermos, the idea is no, right? The whole point of a thermos is to keep heat from transferring from uh, inside your thermos to outside or outside to inside, right? That's the idea. Is you're trying to prevent any heat surrounding. And in a perfect thermos. That would be true. Now, there's no such thing as a perfect thermos, but let's not get into that. But ideally, an isolated system would have no heat transfer to the surroundings. Now, what about mass transfer? Well, in a thermos, right, you got a lid on it. And so you can turn it upside down and your hot chocolate's not going to fall out. And so that whole idea of a thermos also is to not let stuff leak out. So you also don't have a mass transfer. You don't have stuff leaking out. It's not like you flip the thermos over and lose a few milliliters of hot chocolate and now your whole your hot chocolate mass went down 
right? So you don't lose mass or gain mass in an isolated system, nor do you gain heat or lose heat in an isolated system either. Now, a closed system is similar, but it doesn't, it, but, it, but it can transfer mass to its surrounding. So an example of this, or sorry, heat to its surrounding. A closed system would be something like a, a coffee cup with lid, like a paper coffee cup. Let me even say that, paper coffee cup. with a lid. The idea, not a lip, the idea is that um, because you have just a paper coffee cup, you know, you grab it and you're like, oh, ow, 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 that, that's hot. It's because it's, it can transfer heat to its surroundings, right? It transfers it right to your hand and you burn it, drop it, and have to go buy a new one. Um, but it can absolutely can transfer heat uh, um, to its surroundings, right? But because it's closed, it has a lid, it's not like the steam is escaping or anything like that. So it's still really no transfer to your surroundings is the idea. No real transfer to your surroundings. And then lastly here, um, for an open system, this is where you can just transfer heat and mass all over the place, right? So a good example of an open system might be a boiling pot of water. Right, if you have a boiling pot of water, Absolutely, you can transfer heat to your surroundings, right? You're heating up the whole kitchen when you're doing this. Um, you put your hand over the pot of water, you can feel it's hot. You can put your hand near the pot of water, you can feel that it's hot. It's transferring heat out of it. But also you're losing mass, right? Because you're losing steam. So like as the steam leaves the pot, you're losing water molecules that whole time as you're boiling away. Your, your mass is going down and down and down and down, right? You, I don't know if you've ever done this by accident, but if you leave a pot of boiling water on the stove, right, eventually it's just going to go dry. All of it's going to evaporate and it's going to go dry. And so open systems, you can lose heat to the surroundings and you can lose the mass of the stuff inside to the surroundings. A closed system, um, you don't lose mass, but, you, but heat, but energy can be transferred in and out of it. And then an isolated system is you don't really lose either one. You don't really lose heat. You don't really lose mass. Um, isolated systems are not very common. These are pretty rare and hard to do. But these two are much more common. Um, especially, especially in chemistry, right? These would be like, examples of this would be like the reactions you do in a lab, maybe something like a distillation, things like that things like that. And we'll talk about more examples in the future, but anytime you have to boil something or you do a recrystallization or you, all, all kinds of stuff, um, heat can flow in and out of that little system, you know, your reaction. And depending on whether or not you cap it and seal it, you could have uh, mass, uh, mass being transferred also. So let me kind of show you a little bit more um, what I mean by like defining systems versus your surroundings. Again, a system is kind of defined by what it is you're looking at. So I could, for example, think, okay, my, my system here, I want my, I want my system I want my system to equal my, uh, my, my reaction in my flask. And I can ask myself, well, what's going on with the heat of this, right? I can say, oh, my reaction, for example, is um, getting really hot. So it's going to transfer heat out to the environment and maybe it's boiling. So I'm going to lose some mass, right? Maybe I lose some mass because it's boiling. So I could say like, oh, and my, this would be an open system in this case, right? This would be an open, I'll not even put that. I'll put open system, my reaction in a flask because I don't have it stoppered. So when it boils and stuff, I'm just going to be losing some of my reagents or my solvents or something like that. And I could be like, hey, that's, that's an open system there. But I could just as easily as, I could just as easily have defined the room that this is in. This, so let's just say I'm looking at the whole room now as my system. Say that's, that's what I'm gonna define the system as instead. So let's say I'm gonna define the room as the system. Now that changes things, right? Now that changes things, because let's say my room is uh, really nicely tightly sealed. So let's say um, tightly sealed. I don't have like air vents or open windows or anything like that. Now all of a sudden I don't really have a loss of mass anymore, right? Because yeah, I'm going to evaporate stuff, but everything is still in 
the system. I'm still in the room, right? The vapor doesn't just disappear. It's just in the room somewhere. Um, and now all of a sudden, it's not an open system. It's a closed system. Because I'm saying, well, the room is not going to let any of the mass out if it's a nice sealed room, even though my reaction is bubbling away. And so you can see how confusing this can be at times if you don't have the same frame of reference as whoever is asking you a question, right? This is fundamentally, in like reality, nothing is different about having a reaction going on in a room. But the way you're going to think about this system and the surroundings changes if you define just the flask as the system you're interested in, or if you define the whole room as the system that you're interested in. And so you're going to really want to pay attention to that frame of reference. That's my point. And so the definition of a system can change depending on what the system is that you are defining. And then um, the second law of thermodynamics is the really depressing law of thermodynamics. It basically just says that the amount of useful energy to do work is decreasing in the universe. That basically everything's going to crap is more or less what it's saying. It's real, real depressing. So it's saying that there's more useless heat energy, right? So that every Basically, every um, uh, process is going gonna, is gonna to lose energy to heat. So there's no such thing as like a perfect engine, for example. All engines are going to lose some energy as heat. And the idea is that heat isn't really useful. You can't really do anything to uh, that. It's kind of like the lowest form of energy. And it's also saying that you're going to have more entropy, which is abbreviated as S. And entropy is sort of defined as disorder, but it's not really disorder. I don't like that definition. It has to do with the energy can be in more possible states. And so uh, the energy is getting more diffuse and also more useless is the idea. And so the whole universe is, is basically going to this useless energy that we can't use to sustain like, anything interesting like life and stuff like that. We're not really going to focus on that too much yet. Um, that will be uh, later for us when we talk about entropy. Right now, I want to focus on, in the next video, on more on these, this first law of thermodynamics and uh, a term called enthalpy, which is also kind of related to heat and has to do with the, the heat flow in and out of systems also. So next video is on enthalpy. Keep an eye out for that. Uh, happy studying.